On the last episode, I left out one gadget in particular, and I did that on purpose, because I knew if I started talking about that, it was going to be a whole other episode. So this is that whole other episode. We're talking virtual reality. Well, let's start from the beginning with a brief history of virtual reality, and it's going to bend the rules of what you think VR is, and I'm also going to just gloss over this, because the entire history would seriously take up hours. So, the extreme basics. During World War I, the military needed a cheap way to train pilots, and enter the most primitive of simulations, the Ruggles Orientator, which spun on all axes, and the potential pilot would have to fight to keep the thing level. And this and other devices were just the basis of flight simulators. Simulators obviously got more complex over time, and they started involving motion through hydraulics and pneumatics. Instruments could be made to read correctly. I mean, hell, we got to the moon on simulators that would seem laughable today. Oh, and speaking of laughable, if you're younger than me, you probably never had to deal with the horror of the Drivo Trainer. They phased those out when I was in high school. You know, actually, speaking of horror... Hey, Tiger. What's up? Oh, hey, Paul. You do horror movie reviews, right? Well, I mean, yeah. I review all kinds of movies. Have you ever seen the movie Red Asphalt? I sincerely hope the motion picture you are about to see pain um, and Paul? agony, needless death, and injury. I sincerely hope the motion picture you are about to see pain and agony. You with me? Why don't you talk to the horror guru? He's more of the gore main type. Well, okay, yeah. Let me just jump him into the call here. Okay, well, I'll just call him directly anyway. Can't talk building an aquarium. The point I'm getting at here is that simulations are not a new thing. What is new is the virtual part. The big boom for this was back in the 90s, and I think this was fueled by just this perfect storm. Technology was cresting, the internet was just starting to become a thing, the new millennium was just around the corner, dot coms were kind of important, and the future was going to be digital and online. Virtual anything was cool. Just putting the word virtual or virtua or VR or any other permutation of on, on stuff, it, okay, a lot of people look at it now and it looked like a gimmick, but at the time we thought this was going to be the future. The future is going to be immersive, online, interconnected, and then the entire thing crashed and burned. It was so violent, it's taken like, what, 15 years before gaming would even start looking at VR again? Now, what's funny to me is that with this latest resurgence, I'm seeing the same kind of hype amping up, but not everywhere. Nintendo has actually stated that VR is in direct contrast with the Wii U, and on the other hand, Project Morpheus, and the Oculus. But the point I'm getting at is a lot of gaming remembers the flame out of VR in the 90s, and seeing it crop up again has made a lot of people wonder, is this just another case of technology fad? But is this just a technology fad? I certainly hope not, because, well, okay, so, and when people say virtual reality, I think they're all stuck on this. They're stuck on the whole goggle thing, and they're not really embracing the whole concept of what virtual reality could be. You know, in the last video, it was brought up that I didn't talk about Steel Battalion, because Steel Battalion came with a very specific controller that you had to use for the game. And, okay, that might have been an oversight on my behalf at the time, but after finding this very specific video, I'm very happy I didn't bring it up. What you're looking at here is called the BSBB. That stands for the Big Steel Battalion Box. This is Mark II. This is a project of a fan of the game, and he takes it to Maker Faires, and I would love to play this thing. I can't possibly do this device justice, so instead I'm just going to encourage you to go to his website and look at how he built it, but let's bring it to the conversation here. At its core, this is full immersion virtual reality. You sit in an enclosed cabin with lighting and sound effects synced to the game, every sensory input is controlled, you've got a coach helping you from outside the box, but other than that you're on your own, focusing on outside your window doing combat with other robots. Or maybe let's try a different gear. This is something I've actually played called Wizard Quest in the Wisconsin Dells. It's a physical location you go to and you're trying to explore an entire space to free these four wizards. That's the game. Over an hour or so, you're going down slides, climbing landings, looking for hidden rooms, diving into ball pits, all while looking for clues. I've been there twice and it's absolutely amazing. And this isn't to mention things like puzzle room games that I've heard about, and I'd love to try those sometime. Technically speaking, these are all virtual reality style games, but okay, just for now, let's go with the pop culture version of virtual reality, and that is the goggles. Yeah, um, he's had some problems. Like my glasses getting stuck on. Ah, 
The first problem with the headset type VR is a physical one. There's actually this thing called sim sickness or stimulator sickness. People who use a VR headset for any length of time start to display the same kind of physical problems that you see with like motion sickness, headache, nausea, vomiting, disorientation, you know, all the good stuff. Research is still ongoing, but the theory that seems to be emerging is it's about sensory conflict. Your eyes and your ears are perceiving one thing, but your inner ear, you know, the part that does balance, that's saying something else, and your brain doesn't like inconsistencies like that. There is a lot of research in figuring out what causes it and how to stop it. And I've heard anecdotally everything from just dimming the lights or taking Dramamine. The people who are making the rift in the Project Morpheus thing, they're working on things like positional tracking and sensors. But my favorite solution is actually out of Purdue University, where they just put a nose on the player. Now that is a big honking schnoz. Now there's other problems that virtual reality has too, and it's something called postural sway. It's something that you'd normally talk about in the realm of biomechanics, but going from the virtual world to the real world, you run into some pretty massive problems. In this NPR article, Dr. K. Stanny said that they have equated the postural sway of VR gaming to similar to being like drunk. And in this case, I can actually kind of relate to it, because if you play a VR game with any headsets and you take it off back to the real world, yeah, there's going to be a couple of moments of disorientation, even from just a few minutes of gameplay. You get it from other immersion style games too, like if you ever play like a hydraulic racing simulator. I mean, if you live by a big arcade restaurant and you go there, uh, look for like a Daytona 500 machine and play it for like 30 minutes and then get in your own car. Actually, on second thought, don't do that. It's a bad idea. Now, related to that, there's also a safety issue here too, and oddly enough, I found a commercial for Hot Pockets of all things that demonstrates it better than I can. I know they play it up for humor, but this is actually kind of a concern, and it's kind of actually happened to me. I remember playing Virtuality way back in the 90s, and they had, it was at North Pier in Chicago, they had a whole storefront, it was really kind of cool. Well, I'm playing Dactyl Nightmare, which is on their stand-up pods, and so I had the headset on, I've got the pistol grip with the trigger and the movement on there, and I see somebody moving, I swing to shoot at them, and my hand hit one of the major building st structural supports, just full-on slammed it. And yeah, it hurt, but my first thought was, what did I hit? There's nothing in front of me. Then it dawned on me. My meat hand hit a wall structure in the real world, while the virtual world is telling me there's absolutely nothing in front of me to hit. It was actually kind of disturbing. Now I can see this actually getting worse once these things start to take off, because you're going to have games like first-person shooters in which people are going to be dodging and ducking and so on. Yeah, imagine if they uh, dodge into a wall, or they dodge into a couch, or even worse, a table, or something like that. Or if you elicit a fight or flight response with somebody and you... yeah, that could be kind of bad. While we have things like the Kinect right now, I've almost been kicked in the face by somebody playing the Kinect because they're not aware of what's going on around them. Now let's make them completely blind? Yeah, it could spell disaster. You know, come to think of it, I think this is one of the reasons the Kinect really never took off. Okay, not counting Kermit Flailers, what are the most popular games for the Kinect? Dance games. And that requires physical skill and coordination to do. So that's going to cut off a lot of people without the ability to move to play those games. Now, I suppose you could say the same thing for a lot of the virtual reality titles. It requires physical movement, and in some cases it's going to involve real skill. Now, I'm not saying that gamers are lazy, but we play video games to unwind. Matter of fact, you know what world-class athletes do with their downtime? They play video games. So honestly, the last thing that a lot of us want to do when we want to relax is to thrash around pretending to do physical things. Assuming naturally that we actually have the skills to do these things. Now let's say there was a game involving like, I don't know, sword play, VR headsets, camera rigs, props, yeah. It would be awesome, but not so much if you don't know how to sword fight. Skadians and kendo players would have a blast, but if you're not limber enough, or if your knees are bad, or if your back is wrecked, yeah, you're just not going to have fun, and that game's going to end up in the trash heap for most players. This isn't counting things like glitches. Because a virtual reality experience, well actually any kind of a simulation experience for that matter, but it's only as good as its flaws. And we're gamers. If there's a glitch or there's something wrong with the code, we're going to exploit it to win. So it's going to become very possible for kendo masters to be completely obliterated by noobs who are just cheating. Yeah, that's going to make a lot of people really, really upset. We don't like it when reality doesn't work. We live in the real world, so we just inherently know how it works. You don't need a degree in fluid dynamics or physics to shower correctly every morning. So when we dive into a fake world that claims to be real, it frustrates us when it doesn't react correctly. 
uh, get the best example I can think of. It kind of bends the rules, and longtime viewers, you remember this, but for the new folks. I played this tactical laser tag variant that bragged that they were... Well, let me just play the clip. This is hands down the most authentic combat simulation you have ever seen. Yeah, after three games there, I was ready to leave. The real coup de grace was when the entire team was killed one second into a match because the other team knew that they could bounce their lasers off the back wall of the starting area, killing us all. I was on the back of the wall, man. Yeah, they reflects off the walls. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. I don't think I need to say things like this, but in the real world, you can't bounce bullets off of a wall behind people to kill them. Yeah, so much for authenticity, but this actually highlights the problem. Even in the most perfect simulation, we see the seams, and when we do, all promises of realism are heaved into the dumpster and the fun is sucked out of it completely. But on the other hand, we also don't want full-on reality either. You remember that little cameo bit we did earlier? That wasn't just shenanigans. Red Asphalt. It was a scare tactic short film series made by the California Highway Patrol designed to be shown in driver's education classes in public schools to 16-year-olds. It was footage of real accident scenes showing real people and their real body parts being removed from real high-speed car wrecks. Go look it up if you've got a strong stomach. The entire series is on YouTube. But the same people who can laugh while watching a horror film feel sick to their stomach while watching Red Asphalt. Because that's reality. This is one of the reasons that it was kind of phased out of most driver's education classes. The message was lost in the fact that it was real. So yeah, for those of you keeping score at home, I actually did just say that gamers don't want real reality and we don't want fake reality either, so what do we want? <sighs> okay, I'm not even going to try to speak for all gamers because, you know, knowing the odds, at least one of you is going to post down in the comment section, I want real reality. Okay, that, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. So instead of speaking for all gamers, let me just speak for myself. What I think is going to happen this time is that they're going to look for a balance point. Somewhere along the way, we're going to find out what's too much disconnect and what's not enough. How well can the technology allow us to move and react naturally while still making engaging gameplay? And somewhere along the way, we're going to find a way to make it accessible to all players. And that's really what's going to unlock the full potential. You know, on one hand, full 3D VR home gaming immersion has its place. If you couple a headset rig with something like a platform like the Virtuix Omni or the Cyberth Virtualizer, I'm probably butchering their names and I don't care. Now, that could revolutionize how games are played completely. Imagine an MMO where you're actually running around the world, or a first-person shooter where you have to literally aim your gun. But, you know, why stop at gaming? How about historic walking tours? How about a bike tour to France where you're in the peloton? Or how about being able to watch a League of Legends tournament from inside the game world? But I also know that humans are social animals. I think there's a future in immersive style VR like the Battalion Box. Virtual reality as a destination entertainment? That would be huge! Imagine, instead of going to the movies, people would go to, like, Escape the Room or a Puzzle Quest destination. They would they could interact in a VR racing lounge, or you could even have, like, a first-person shooter bar, like a paintball field, without all the paintball stuff. No virtual hangout will ever replace the human experience, and in a weird way, VR could actually bring people together, and that would actually be really cool. But again, they've got to keep a foot in reality while putting the other foot forward. Making these things accessible is what's going to be the key to making them successful. Like those movement platforms. Th those are great, assuming that you have full mobility. There's a lot of gamers like myself with bad knees or other physical restrictions, and we just can't run or we can't walk on those things. So hardware and software designers are going to have to keep that in mind or they're going to risk losing a lot of customers. You know, the funny thing is, back in the 90s, a lot of people thought that the virtual reality boom was going to make us all shut-ins. We were going to sit in our apartments, plug in our headsets, lay on the couch, and just live in our virtual world with minimal outside contact. Ethically, I can kind of see where that would be an issue with some people, but I really don't think that's going to become the norm. Instead, I think it's just going to find its own market. So yeah, stuff like this, I want to see this happen, I want to see this take off, but I do kind of have a selfish purpose for that. Because you see, stuff like this would be the only way I could really enjoy a first person shooter, but then again, I do kind of have over two decades of experience in first person shooters, and I'm not the only one. Bring it on, noobs.
for um, an entire episode about virtual reality and I don't even get a nod? That's because the next episode I've got a really big job for you. For starters, I need you to find Goha. <laughs> Piece of cake. Keep up if you can.